Go forward. Your solution is ahead of you, not in your past. Move forward. Get past your mistake. Get past what you've done already. Move forward. Your deliverance is in you doing something different. You have a future. How are you going to get there dwelling on what's behind you? That I ain't got no time for no foolishness. If anybody get in your way, remember I told you slack not. Run them down. God fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. Fed them with fish and bread when they needed God marched the Israelites around for 40 years and their clothes never wore out. God provided water out of a rock when we were thirsty. Do we serve a God that supplies all of our needs or does our supplies become our God? Thank you. Y'all turn. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Hey, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the water. And he that hath no money, help me, come ye, buy and eat. Yeah, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's saying here that if you're thirsty, go get to the living water, the water of life, everlasting life. This is what your soul wants. This is what your soul needs. This is the desire of your soul, living water. Water that has everlasting life. Jesus said, you don't need money, but you still got to buy it. You have to buy it with your life. Our lives before Christ not compatible with holiness, so it's going to require a change, and that change is us buying our way into the presence of the Lord. Verse 2 says, Where, wherefore, that means why, what reason do you spend money for that which is not bread? This is indicating that you should spend money on bread that God can provide? He's asking, why do you get up and go to work every day and you never satisfied. The money that we take to pay bills and taxes satisfies us not. Do you spend money on alcohol and going to the club? Yes or no? Do you spend money on vanity and things to beautify yourself? Are you satisfied? Have you had enough? That, that this means, it literally means, listen, extremely careful. He says, I want you to eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Your help, Lord Jesus. When he says, let your soul delight itself in fatness, you think he's talking about food. He said, let your soul delight, not your flesh. How do you let your soul delight itself in fatness? In this final hour, before the Lord returns, he's so gracious, he's so nice. He's telling us, where we need to be, and he's telling us what we should be doing one hour before the Lord returns. Will you be still searching for fleshly desires, or will you have discovered how to delight your soul in fatness? You have figured it out yet. when the Lord returns. God is awesome. When we get back to verse one, I want y'all, I want to read a couple times, I really want y'all to get it. God said, everybody that, that's thirsty, come y'all to the water. What water? Why does God talk like that? He talks like that because this ain't for everybody. When you live life and you decide you're not going to give up, that means you're going to go through hard times just like every human. When bad things happen, don't think you're the first person to turn to substance or lust to try to satisfy what your soul is craving. The problem is my flesh can't dictate what my soul needs. My flesh can't advocate for my soul. And you, me, we've all done it. We've been living our life through the dark lens of our flesh and not controlling our flesh with our soul. That's a problem. That's a problem for us humans. This is what God is trying to deal with. Does your soul, does your soul or your flesh Crave nicotine. Which one? Does your flesh or your soul crave love or attention and affirmation from the opposite sex? If you're satisfied, why do you keep having to do it? Why can't getting drunk this time satisfy me? 
And while you're doing that, your soul remains thirsty. Your soul is ignored. Your soul gets no attention. You forced your soul to be tied up and linked up with somebody that your flesh chose. How then is your soul going to be satisfied? Your flesh made that. And he that hath no money, come, buy, eat. Yeah, come, buy wine and milk without money and without pride. Why do you walk outside exposing your naked? You used to have shame. Hey, grown man, why don't you want to protect little girls from seeing your underwear? Does this make your soul satisfied? What response do you want from your butt cheeks and your cleavage on display? If you want a degree, you got to sacrifice, right? However many years you have to do it, it's a sacrifice. You want the blessings of God without tearing or bruising your flesh? You want eternal life without giving up anything? How precious is eternal life? Paul said, I threw up the white flag. I've already surrendered my life to the Lord. He said, from this point on, let no man bother me because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I got the receipt that I changed my life and it cost me. There are people that had to walk away from a relationship that they couldn't prove that God put together. There are people that had to quit a job that wasn't allowing them to keep the commandment. Paul is saying, I don't want to hear your excuses of what your flesh still wants to hold on to. I gave all that stuff up and I've been beaten. Yeah, Paul has been beaten and abused for the gospel. And he says, I got the mark of Jesus, but I'm still here. It didn't take me out. Hallelujah. I want to bear the marks of my body. So in order to do that, I have to take up my cross and follow him. Psalm 42 says, Psalm 42, verse 2, my soul, not my flesh, is thirsty for God. Not a few, not a new religion, a new found religion, not to burn sage. My soul thirsts for the living God. Hey God, when can I come and appear before you? When can I see your face? God, when can I give you a hug? When can I wrap my arms around you? God said, you can come whenever you want. God said, you can come whenever you're ready. When God, can I present myself to you for your approval? You're going to stand before God. What are you going to wear? How are you going to do your hair? I want you to think about this. Are you going to slip up and cuss? What, what can I... When, God? When can I be done with the struggles of this present world and stand before you? God says, I'm on my way. And I'm coming quick. In a few short days, saints, you won't have to worry about how you're going to get to work. In a few short days... You don't have to worry about how you're going to pay your bills. Real soon, we will be able to appear before God Almighty. Real soon. He says, I'm coming. And my reward is, God said, don't be like hypocrites. Praying just to be heard. God knows what things you have need of before you ask him. If God already knows what you need before you ask him, what's the point of asking? If God knows I lost my job, why do I need to tell him that I need a new job? If I'm sick and God can see the sickness inside of my body, why do I have to waste time telling it? Explain this. Matthew 6.30 says, if God, does such a, if God does such a good job clothing the grass of the field, which is today, which is today, the grass of the field, but tomorrow is dried up and is used for fire, shall he not not much more clothed. Oh, you of little faith. God clothed the field. God created clothes for the field. That grass from today is used to light a fire in your oven tomorrow. God will take care of you. If he cares about the grass, if he cares about the field, he's a proven provider. Since he cares about the field, of course he cares about you. Because of that, the Bible says, take no thought, none. Don't worry about how you're going to eat. Don't worry about how you're going to drink. God has already set up your meal plan for your entire life. God said, don't worry about where you're going to get clothes. Got you. He said, this is what the Gentiles chase after. 
You have a God that knows what you need before you even pray. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? Who wouldn't serve a God that knows what you need before you even pray and he cares about you? Matthew 6 verse 31 says, because of that, because of what? Since God knows what you need, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we be clothed? We know this system is created for you to have to go to school, work, what they call success. To the world, success is being able to buy food, buy clothes. God says, don't even worry about that. What would it even matter? Because in a few short days, Revelation 13, 17 says, and that no man might buy or sell except he had that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is happening in a few short days. The stuff you need is a part of God's plan. He already planned your life out. And he already knows what you need as part of your life. And you can tell God is talking like the stuff our flesh needs is not a big deal. No, just listen to how he's saying. Food, clothes, housing. That's nothing. He's more concerned about your soul. That's why he said the first thing you need to seek is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's when he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. When you do that, you, your anxiety level diminishes. That's when he says, because of that, don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow is going to deal with itself. There's enough evil stuff going on to deal with today. Now you can plan for tomorrow, say Lord's willing. All right. But we are not allowed to worry about tomorrow. We got enough trouble going on today. Don't worry if they're going to fire you tomorrow. You got work to do today. Don't worry about your pending surgery next week. God can heal you today. John 4, 13 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, met a woman at the well. Talking to this woman that's drawing her water. He says, whoever drinks of the water from earth, water you gather, they're going to be thirsty again. But whosoever drink of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. The water that I give shall be in him a well of water, bringing up into everlasting life. He was never talking about H2O. Glad you're here, Linus. He's talking about everlasting life. The water that he's talking about is everlasting life. Revelation 21, 5 says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things. And he said unto me, right. But these words are faithful and true. Next verse. And he said unto me, it is done. What's done? Your whole life is already written out. Stop worrying. God is in full control. It's already written that you're going to be okay. God started this process before you were born. He said, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end, and I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of water of life freely. Have you found out what you're really thirsty? Have you found out what your soul is thirsty for? It's not carnal. It's not tangible stuff. Your soul thirsts for the living God, and he's waiting to see if you ask him about that. Yes, he wants to hear you talk to him about that. All you have to do is overcome your flesh. Stop yielding to it. Say no. Overcome this world system. Seek God first. You set your alarm clock to go to work. Seek God first. You put multiple events in your calendar. Where's the event to spend time with God? Revelation 21, 7, it says, He that overcomes shall inherit all things. God said it, not me. He said, you're going to get everything. He said, I will be your God. Who's God? The person that overcomes their flesh. And that person shall be my son. Sister God said, you're going to belong to me. Thank you. Overcome your flesh and you'll be God's child. Who would serve a God like that? And the spirit and the bride said, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is thirsty, come. Put the rat race second. Put the buying and selling second. And whosoever will... Let him take of the water, take the water of life freely. God created eternal life to be something you cannot get. 
It is impossible. Listen carefully. It is impossible for you to obtain eternal life. He has to give it to you. You got to go through him. That's the water that he's talking about. That's what the water represents. Is God creating a need in your soul? And then he himself becomes the only person. He himself becomes what your soul needs. He creates the need in your soul. Got that? And then he becomes what your soul needs. You can't get away from it. Your life has been set up with a void on purpose. The trauma in your life creates the void that only God can fulfill. He is what your soul needs. And only those who choose him instead of this world will find what quenches their soul. Thank you, Jesus. There was a woman from the tribe of Issachar. 2 Kings 4 verse 9 records her saying to her husband, Hey, hubby, listen, I truly that guy we keep seeing walking past here, I, I think he's a holy man of God. He was talking about the prophet Elijah. He walked over 15 miles to get from one city to the next city to ministry. Verse 10 says to her hubby, let us make a room for him upstairs in the attic. We're not using that space. And, and let's set up a nice bed and, and a table and a stool and let's put some LED lights up there so when he passed through town, he stay here. Is it a good decision to choose to be close to the anointing? All right. Man of God is great. He tells his servant, yo, this this woman is nice. She got us a place up here. Tell her. Go tell her. Since she's been so hospitable for us, all this care, ask her what is it that she want us to do for her? What is it that she want to be done? For her? Ask her, would you like for us to talk to the king? So he goes and he asks her. Would you like for us to talk to the king for you or, or the captain of the army? And she answered, nah, I only deal with my own people. I'm good. I don't need any special favor. And he said, okay. So what are we going to do for her? And Gehazi, his servant, answered, said, well, I noticed she ain't got no kids. And her husband is old. And he said, uh, okay, I got you. So he goes to the woman and he tells her, listen, this same time next year, you will embrace a son. Thank you. And she said, no, no. No, my Lord, the man of God, do not lie to me. Do not lie to me. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What kind of response is that? Husband is old, so she probably has childbearing. I can imagine she had to deal with the shame, especially back then, right? The, the, the shame of not being able to have kids. You know, people always got something to say, always bumping their gums and running their mouth. We put enough pressure on women. She already came to the hopeless conclusion that I'm never going to be a mother. Accepted that. And now he's offering me to have to deal with something I've already accepted. Oh my God. So out of her soul, she says, no, I don't want false hope. I lived a life of disappointment for years, not being able to give my husband what every other wife is giving their husband. I don't want to be disappointed anymore. I got over that years ago. God didn't owe her a favor, but he gave her a promise. God knows what her soul. Of course, she prayed throughout her life for God to open her womb, and he never did. And that hurt her soul, but she learned to deal with it. Verse 17, the Bible says, and the woman conceived. Her son, at the same time that Elijah said she would. Verse 18, and when the child was a little older, he went out to work with his daddy. They went out to harvest it. And he said unto his father, Dad, my, my head, Dad, my head, my head, my head. His father said, he said to another kid, Hey, take my son and, and carry him to his mother. And, and when he took the, the, the guy that he told him, took him to his mother, mother took her son, put him on her knees, sat on her knees till about noon, and then he died. Wait, what? Sounds like he had an aneurysm, right? Why would God allow her son to do This is a pain that cannot be described. I won't be able to understand that. Because it's so wrong for a mother to bury her son. It's so unnatural for a woman that nurtures 
to have to deal with the death of what she brought into life. There's nothing on earth that can compare to that pain. This pain kills your soul. So she took her baby boy, took him upstairs, and she laid him in the man of God's bed. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 24, she told her husband, give me one of your employees so I can run to the man of God. The husband, being a husband, said, what? Plus, it's not even Sabbath. He's not even going to deal with you. He said, it shall be well. It shall be well. She couldn't find a horse. That this donkey will do. And she told the employee, listen to me very carefully. Drive. Go forward. Black not. Don't stop your riding for me, except I tell you to stop. Other than that, go forward. Why did she say go forward? Donkeys don't run backwards. Go forward. Your solution is ahead of you. Not in your past. Move forward. Get past your mistake. Get past what you've done already. Move forward. Your deliverance is in you doing something different. You have a future. How are you going to get there dwelling on what's behind you? That I ain't got no time for no foolishness. If anybody get in your way, remember I told you slack not. Run them down. She wants this guy to keep going no matter what. And that's what you do when your soul gets in trouble. She wasn't worried about food. She wasn't worried about anything for her flesh. She wasn't worried about water, clothes, or fun. She had a crisis that affected her soul. She told this guy, don't stop. Run, run to the presence of the Lord. Run to God. When you have a dead child, you ain't got any other problem. No, you don't. This woman had a solution for her vexed soul. Nothing worldly, nothing carnal, nothing fleshly could soothe her soul. I need God to look past my flesh and see what my soul needs and give that to me. Give me God. God, give me what my inner soul needs. Y'all need to say that. God, give me what my soul needs. Give me what my inner soul needs. Forget about my flesh for a moment. Don't worry about how much it'll hurt. Tear everything out of my flesh that's not like you, Jesus, and give me what my soul needs. You, God, you know what my soul needs. You know what will heal my internal wounds. Doctors can't help me. Friends won't understand. And she had enough good sense. She knew to run to God. Ride, drive, go forward. Get me to the anointing. Is it a good thing to be in the presence of the anointing? Is it a good thing to be where the anointing is? You ought to try your best every morning, every day to be in the presence of God at least for a portion of the day. You got to get into the anointing. She gets to the city. Thank you, Jesus. She gets off the donkey. She starts looking for the man of God. And when the man of God saw her far off, he said to his servant, Gehazi, he said, look, look over there. Is that the Shulamite? Because he can't understand what she's doing here. He's confused. How did she get way over here? Thank God if you have a man of God that's concerned about your well-being and not just your offering. Thank God that you have a man of God that is praying tonight and asking God to deliver. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Kings 4, verse 26, tells his servant Gehazi, Run to meet her and ask her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Ask her, is it well with the child? He did. He asked her, hey, is, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she said, it is well. I'll tell you whatever I got to tell you. Get out of my way. I'm looking for the anointing and you ain't got it. Thank you. Somebody knows that that's what's important to look for the anointing. Why would I waste time with people that's not saturated with the power of God? Carnally minded, fleshly, worldly people can't do nothing for me. Move! I need to get to the God that cares about me and my family. And I know God cares about all of my pain. God cares about what I care about. If you believe that, say it to yourself. God cares about what I care about. God cares about what I care about. What does the trauma in your childhood dictate? What does the trauma in your childhood dictate that your soul needs? And you've been searching in the wrong place. You're itching for a scratch instead of scratching for an itch. Fatherless children, you need Jesus to be your father. If you've been neglected or rejected, you need Jesus to be your comforter. If you have anxiety, you need Jesus 
to be your guide. He's the lamp to your feet. If you've been abused or bullied, God, the Lion of Judah, will allow you to rule and reign with him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. Your soul solution, the solution for your soul is found in Jesus. If you're lonely, you need Jesus. Jesus is the only God that will talk back to you. Sometimes that's all I need. I need to hear your voice, God. Let me feel your presence again, God, one more time. Every now and again, God, I need to feel you. Thank you, Jesus. Talk to me, Lord. Your servant hears you. Don't you know if you're broke, you need Jesus? Because God is a provider. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have to do anything ungodly to make ends meet. Meet Jesus. You can't fix life's problems with tangible things. The issues of life, they will always remain until you persistently get on a beast and run to God. And if anybody try to stop you on the way, anybody try to stop you giving your life to God, tell them it's well. It's well. So they can get out your way. Get to the altar. Get to God. You can get to the presence of God. 2 Kings 4.27 says, And when she came to the man of God to the hill, as she's coming up the hill, before she can even get to him, before she can even reach him, she grabbed his feet. But old stinking Gehazi, he came near to thrust her away. Always somebody telling you don't take all that. You ain't the one with a dead child. Always somebody that got solutions for you with their raggedy life. Thank you, Jesus. How are you going to give me marriage advice? You ain't got no husband. How are you going to tell me how to raise my kid and your kids got the spirit of Chucky and, and Freddy Krueger and, and baby Jason, they living in your house and you trying to tell me how to raise my kid. Verse 27, and the man of God, basically here he interceded for her. He said, leave her alone. Her soul is vexed in her. It's her soul that's vexed in her. The man of God can look at he can, he can just take a look and say that her soul is back. What in, what in this life has frustrated your soul? What exactly has vexed your soul? As she's down as low as she can go, burdened with grief and the pain in her soul, she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, don't lie to me? Why did you get my hopes up high? I've had enough disappointments in my life, I became transparent and I opened up to you and you allowed me to be tricked. You allowed me to be deceived and disappointed again. All of my marriage, I had to feel like a failure. Thank you. Because I couldn't give my husband a son. This is a trigger for me. You made me think about stuff in my past that I wanted to forget about. Thanks, this is why you got to make peace with your past so you can go forward. Thank you, Jesus. So you don't have to live in regret. That room that she had, she could have rented it out for some money. But she used her money to bless God. She put her time into the ministry. Now she's doing a coulda, woulda, shoulda. This vexed her soul. Don't live in regret. Get out of that. Get out of that. Fight it. Go forward. All of your steps are ordered by the Lord, even your mistakes. Because with your mistakes, God put something down on the inside that says never again. He knew you'd learn from that. You don't have to hate your mistakes. You, you don't have to hate your mistakes. You don't have to hate your mistakes. You don't have to hate your mistakes. Don't accept regret. Go forward. Thank you. What, what in this life? I'll ask one more time. What in this life? Think about it. Frustrated your soul. You're looking in the wrong place again? Try God. Forget about those small things that you can't overcome and let God quench your thirst. Since you're thirsty, come to the water. Even if you don't know how, we will help you. We'll show you how. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, come, y'all. Buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money. Because God is offering himself. Why are you spending money running here and there and doing this and that? What you're getting isn't bread. It ain't the living bread. It will always come with consequences. Why do you work so hard and put so much effort into things that will never satisfy you? Listen to the voice of the Lord. Come to Jesus. Trade your life. Trade your life in for the one that he has. Then your soul 
will be happy. Read this with me. Hey, everybody that's thirsty, come to the water. If you ain't got no money, God said, come anyway. Come get me. I don't care what you've done. Come. I got what your soul needs. And it's free. I won't disappoint you. Verse 2. Why do you keep chasing after stuff that has no real value? Why do you work so hard for stuff that will never satisfy your soul? It says, listen diligent. Listen very carefully. Let me, God is saying, let me refresh your soul. I'm the only person that can give you what you need. No consequences. You'll never regret it. No walk of shame. No pain. No consequences. No false hope. Thank you. Verse 3 says, incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, I mean, listen, and your soul shall live. God's goal is for your soul to live. He said, then I will make a covenant, an everlasting covenant with you. Who doesn't want God to make a covenant with them, a promise with them, a contract with them? Verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Notice it says, may be found while you are able to find him. Because you can only come to him while he's drawing you. And that's what he's doing now. That's why you're here today. That's why you clicked on this link. Call him while he's near. But you got to make some changes. Come to God and he will have mercy on you. He'll make the crooked way straight. He'll bring the high place down. And he will forgive you for everything you've done. Verse 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to God and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. This is a chance of a lifetime. Verse 8, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. God don't think the same way we do. Neither are your way my way, says the Lord. He never operates the way we want him to. Just trust him. Start today and keep moving forward. Make a major change today and go forward. The prophet sent Gehazi. Send him back. Tell him, take my rod. Go lay it on the boy. Gehazi did that. But it didn't work. So the man of God comes himself. When he gets there, when the man of God made it back to the house, verse 35 says he walked in the house and he walked back and forth. He walked to and fro. Why was the man of God walking back and forth? And why didn't God tell him that the king died? Will you accept your deliverance if it makes no sense? Will you accept the way that God chooses to deliver you? The Bible says he went upstairs and he stretched himself on top of him, put his face on top of his face, he laid on top of his boy. Who told him to stretch himself on top? The Bible says, and the kid sneezed seven times and then the child's eyes opened. Thank you, Jesus. And he called Gehazi and said, listen, call the Shunammite. So he called him. And when she came upstairs, he said, hey, take your son. Give him something to eat. Try to please your flesh. You'll bruise your soul. But if you heal your soul, you hurt your flesh. That's a decision you have to make. But you'll be pleasing God if you please your soul. While God is calling you, respond. He's offering you the best life for free. And eternal life. He wants you to heal the hurt of your soul, but you can't do it. And he wants you to rely on him. He created that need so you come to him. Simply accept it. It's a gift from him. It's a gift from God. Don't worry about your flesh right now. Thank you, Jesus. Let God heal your soul. The desires you have can't be fixed with your daily routine. It's time to do something else so you can go forward. You need to cleanse your soul with living water. Thank you, Jesus. God is awesome. God is holy. And he's calling you to give you a new life. You cannot fix this on your own.